Greetings. The Fulbright Association is pleased to welcome all our attendees today for this Fulbright Forum in honor of the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright Program, entitled Celebrating 75 Years, History and Impact of the Fulbright Program. The Fulbright Association extends the Fulbright International Exchange into a lifelong experience for U.S. alumni. We connect alumni and friends of the Fulbright Program through lifelong learning, collaborative networking, and service projects at home and abroad. Through our 54 local chapters, the Fulbright Association hosts more than 230 regional and national programs each year for visiting Fulbrighters and alumni throughout the U.S. This fall, we will have a 44th annual conference, which will be held virtually from October 20th to 22nd. Also, very exciting, we will have an in-person Fulbright Prize ceremony, which we will honor Bono, the lead singer of U2 and co-founder of the One Campaign and Red. Now, I will turn it over to to, to our panel for today's forum. Thank you very much, Munir. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Lawrence Hare. I'm an associate professor and the chair of the Department of History at the University of Arkansas. And it is my pleasure to be your moderator today for what will be a, a terrific panel discussion uh, celebrating the 75th anniversary of the, of the Fulbright programs. I'd like to say a special word of thanks to Fulbright Association President Dee Dee Long and to Executive Director John Bader. And John will be joining us at the end, I hope. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. So we'll be talking today, of course, about the history of the Fulbright program. But of course, our concerns are also gonna be with the future of the Fulbright program, the next 75 years. Um, the guests that we've brought together today have strong international connections, obviously, but what brings them together here uh, is first a common interest in better understanding the history of the Fulbright programs, and second, a common tie to their work um, through the University of Arkansas. The U of A, of course, is the alma mater of Senator Fulbright, who graduated with a degree in history, I, I must say, uh, and uh, was president of our institution briefly. Um, it was here at the, at the U of A that Senator Fulbright found his pathway to a Rhodes Scholarship and which informed, as you'll learn, informed his um, choices later to create the Fulbright program and write the legislation. Um, and we have been uh, in the last three years working on a project together um, funded by a, a, a grant from the Chancellor's Innovation and Collaboration Fund to promote research into Fulbright programs um, in order to better understand the origins of the program and to shape the values for its future trajectories. So in today's panel, we'll be talking about uh, the work that we've been doing in connection with this project, uh, showing you some of the things that we've learned from the last 75 years of uh, the history of the program. I'll be introducing the speakers one at a time. And as, as you go along, if you have questions, you'll notice there's a QA and a um, button at the bottom of your screen. You're welcome to uh, put your questions in the Q&A, uh, or you can also use the chat uh, feature to do that. And then at the end of the presentations, we'll have a brief discussion. So with that being said, uh, let's start with our first panelist and welcome Dr. Lonnie Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson is a, a native of Minnesota, but he has been living in Vienna, Austria for some years and been serving as the executive director of the Austrian Fulbright Commission. He is a, um, a very well-respected uh, historian of Central Europe um, and also writing a history of the Fulbright program now, which is called Remembering and Forgetting Fulbright, the remarkable history of the Fulbright program, 1946 uh, to 1971, which will be published by the University of Arkansas Press. And so he will be talking today about uh, the history of the program uh, from its earliest days. So Dr. Johnson, I'll turn it over to you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Lawrence. Uh, I simply want to note I've had the opportunity to come down to Fayetteville a number of times to work with the uh, special collections and uh, what, a, what a wonderful and uh, valuable uh, resource that is. And I'd just like to ask uh, Munir now to uh, run my PowerPoint. I've pre-recorded that. And then we'll uh, move on to uh, Lori, I believe. Thank you, Lawrence. Munir, let it roll. This is Senator J. William Fulbright. He was born in 1905 as the fourth of six children of J. and Roberta Fulbright, who were homesteaders in Missouri. He grew up in Fayetteville in northwestern Arkansas. 
His father was a hog farmer turned investor and successful entrepreneur. Consequently, Bill Fulbright grew up in one of the wealthiest and most influential families of Fayetteville. He attended grade school and high school at the Peabody Experimental School, a teacher training facility for the School of Education on the campus of the University of Arkansas, which was just four blocks from his family's stately home. After graduating from high school, he enrolled at the University of Arkansas, was a good student, elected president of the student body, and excelled on the football field. He graduated in 1924. Fulbright literally grew up on the campus of the University of Arkansas and rarely left Fayetteville. His childhood and youth were privileged and patrician, but parochial and provincial too. His leadership profile, decent grades, athleticism, and his family's social standing made him an attractive candidate for a Rhodes Scholarship. Starting in the fall of 1925, he studied history and government at Oxford's Pembroke College for three years and traveled extensively on the European continent. He also played tennis, rugby, and lacrosse and was active in student clubs. His Rhodes Scholarship was a transformative experience for him. He later called it the dominant influence in the creation of the Fulbright Awards. After graduating in June 1928, Fulbright traveled in Europe with his mother, then settled in Vienna for eight months, where he spent an increasing amount of time at the Café Louvre, a hangout for American journalists and European newspaper correspondents. These Viennese contacts and exposure to life in Central Europe provided him with what his biographer Randall Woods has called his introduction to the real world of international politics. After returning to the United States, he studied law with distinction at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., married Elizabeth Williams, and worked at the Department of Justice for a year. He then taught law at GW as an instructor for two semesters before returning to Arkansas in 1934 to manage family businesses and lecture part-time at the University of Arkansas Law School. In 1939, at the age of 34, he was named president of the University of Arkansas, an appointment that testified to the reputation and political clout of his family and ultimately began his career in politics. In 1942, he ran successfully for the House of Representatives and was off to Washington, where he gained national attention in 1943 as an advocate of internationalism by authoring the so-called Fulbright Resolution, favoring the participation of the United States in what was to become the United Nations. In 1944, he ran successfully for the U.S. Senate, where he served five terms and eventually became the longest-serving chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. In August 1945, Fulbright was shocked by the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He immediately recognized the implications of the advent of the nuclear age for international politics and called the atomic bombings in Japan the immediate cause of my sponsorship of the legislation to set up an exchange program. On September 27, 1945, six weeks after the end of the war, Fulbright introduced a bill to the Senate authorizing the use of credits established through the sale of surplus properties abroad for the promotion of international goodwill through the exchanges of students in the fields of education, culture, and science. Fulbright's bill was based on a simple but ingenious idea, amending the Surplus Property Act of 1944 a piece of legislation that had nothing to do with education or exchanges. The purpose of the Surplus Property Act was to help the U.S. transition from a wartime to a peacetime economy by selling off wartime surpluses at home and abroad, and this created windfall revenues in non-convertible currencies overseas. Identifying these revenues from the sale of wartime surpluses overseas to finance exchanges was Fulbright's inspired idea. Fulbright's initial bill needed to be refined and amended, and he inconspicuously moved it through Congress without attracting much attention or debate. Looking back, he said he knew it was potentially controversial. President Truman signed Fulbright's amendment into law on August 1, 1946. This is the Fulbright Act in its entirety. It is less than two pages long and highly technical, and it has an almost incomprehensible title an act to amend the Surplus Property Act of 1944 to designate the Department of State as the disposal agency for surplus property outside of the continental United States, its territories, and for other purposes. One of those other purposes was to fund the academic exchanges Fulbright initially had proposed in September 1945. The Fulbright Act established the basic architecture of the Fulbright program by doing five things. First, it designated the State Department as the sole agency of the U.S. government 
for the disposal of surplus properties overseas. The U.S. government had billions of dollars of wartime material stockpiled overseas in former theaters of war, building materials, fuel, vehicles, medicine, food. These assets, which the historian Sam Lebovich has called war junk, were complicated and expensive to maintain. Foreign governments did not have the U.S. dollars to buy them, so the U.S. government decided to extend credits to foreign governments and to accept non-convertible foreign currencies as payment in order to sell them. Second, it authorized the Secretary of State to conclude executive agreements with foreign governments to fund exchanges with countries that had purchased wartime surpluses. Between 1947 and 1952, the United States concluded 28 executive agreements with countries in former theaters of war on four continents where surplus properties were available. After 1955, 15 further Fulbright agreements based on the sale of agricultural surpluses were concluded, which also extended the program to Latin America. Third, these executive agreements provided for the establishment of unique binational educational commissions that had boards with equal numbers of members, with the Americans appointed by U.S. ambassadors and citizens from partner countries nominated by their own governments. This parity made participating countries equal partners in a program of reciprocal exchanges. These boards then hired local staff to manage the program on the ground. Fulbright commissions recruited outgoing students and scholars for grants to go to the United States and hosted incoming U.S. Fulbright grantees. All Fulbright grantees traveled by ocean liner in the olden days when international travel was rare and a real luxury. Fourth, it earmarked funds for these bilateral exchanges. A, for financing studies, research, instruction, and other educational activities of or for American citizens abroad, including payment for transportation, tuition, maintenance, and other expenses. However, under B, it only provided for furnishing transportation for citizens of foreign countries who wanted to study in the United States. This established the original asymmetrical structure of the program. Grants initially could cover all of the costs incurred by U.S. grantees overseas with foreign currencies, but none of the costs incurred by foreign grantees in the United States in U.S. dollars because all of the revenues were in foreign currencies. Nor did the Act provide for the U.S. dollars necessary to cover the costs for the stateside administration of the program. These shortcomings urgently needed to be addressed in order to get the program off the ground. Fifth, the Fulbright Act authorized the U.S. President to appoint a Board of Foreign Scholarships, BFS, consisting of 10 members, composed of representatives of cultural, educational, student, and war veteran groups. The BFS was populated with a representative cross-section of leading academics, university executives, and experts who, as private citizens, assumed the responsibility for establishing Fulbright program policies and governing the program. The State Department's Office for Exchanges, the forerunner of today's Bureau for Educational and Cultural Affairs, assumed administrative tasks, and the BFS decided to turn to a number of existing organizations to help manage the program. These so-called cooperating agencies were the Conference Board of Associated Research Councils for Scholars, the Institute for International Education in New York City for graduate students, and the U.S. Office of Education for teachers. This put the final touches on the architecture of the program, which was complicated with lots of different players and moving parts. The red boxes on the left, from top to bottom, the Board of Foreign Scholarships, the State Department Office for Exchanges, and the cooperating agencies, were in the United States. The red boxes on the right, the executive agreements that established binational commissions with their staffs, provided for the program overseas. Two factors decisively contributed to getting the Fulbright program off the ground. The first was the passage of the United States Information and Educational Exchange Act of 1948, or Smith-Munt Act, which provided urgently needed U.S. dollars for the stateside costs of the Fulbright program, as well as for the establishment of other U.S. government exchange programs. Second, the BFS solicited support for incoming Fulbright grantees from the diverse institutions of American higher education communities. And they really stepped up to the plate to host them by covering their costs with comprehensive packages of cash and in-kind support. 
Incoming Fulbrighters were genuinely impressed by the friendliness, curiosity, generosity, and hospitality they experienced in the United States. Once all of the necessary operative parts had fallen into place, the program rapidly gained momentum. In 1948-49, only 84 grantees in three countries participated in the program. However, in the following year, there were over 1,800 grantees from 11 countries, and by 1955-56, 4,700 grantees from 22 countries. The program grew by leaps and bounds in the 50s and 60s. Today, 79% of the program's 400,000 plus alumni have been sponsored by countries with binational Fulbright commissions. On August 1st, 1961, President Kennedy invited Senator Fulbright and the congressman who had played key roles in the passage of the legislation in 1946 to a 15th anniversary commemoration of the program in the Rose Garden at the White House. He observed that this program has been one of the great acts of creative and constructive statesmanship in the post-war period. Fulbright grants are known throughout the world for the ceaseless, informal, and effective work they do for a better world understanding and for developing the talent of individuals. By 1961, 41 countries with Fulbright commissions were participating in the program, which had over 50,000 alumni, which made it the largest exchange program in the world at the time. Kennedy also praised the foresight and ingenuity of Fulbright. At the end of World War II, you saw both the need and the opportunity to establish a large-scale exchange program with other nations on the principle of a two-way street. Kennedy concluded his formal remarks by saying, thanks to your leadership in this field, Congress is presently considering new legislation which would consolidate and strengthen various existing legislation and thereby establish a firm basis for moving forward in the 60s. This new legislation Kennedy referenced was the Mutual Educational and Cultural Exchange Act of 1961, better known as the Fulbright-Hayes Act, which Kennedy signed into law on September 23, 1961, marking the beginning of a new chapter in the history of the Fulbright program. It provided the foundations for the future growth and expansion of the Fulbright program and still serves as the statutory basis of the program today. Finally, Kennedy praised the Fulbright program with a reference to the Old Testament. Of all the examples in recent history of beating swords into plowshares, of having some benefit come to humanity out of the destruction of war, I think that this program and its results will be among the most preeminent. Thanks a lot for your video, Dr. Johnson. Do you have anything to add uh, to your presentation? Uh, not at this point. Uh, uh, one picture is worth a thousand words and a video is worth 10,000. <laughs> right. Well, thanks a lot. Okay, so our, our next presenter will be Dr. Lori Burrell. And uh, Dr. Burrell is the Associate Dean of, uh, of the Special Collections Division at the University Libraries at the University of Arkansas. And she's been a terrific partner for, for me working on this project to promote research into the Fulbright programs. She's also been a terrific leader at the university libraries. And in fact, she's writing a book on this topic, um, developing the next generation of library leaders. So we're so delighted to have uh, you join us today, Dr. Burrell, to talk about the collections at the U of A, the ones that, uh, that uh, Dr. Johnson was referring to uh, for his own research. Well, great. It's wonderful to be with you all today. And thanks so much, Lawrence, for that very kind introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. So I'm delighted to be joining you to talk to you about the different resources in our archive uh, that we have that document the Fulbright program. You've seen some snippets of it already from Lonnie's presentation, so I'm excited to dig in a little deeper uh, about this. So our division's mission is to collect, preserve, and make available for research materials that document the human experience. So first, what is an archive? An archive refers to the permanently valuable records such as letters, reports, accounts, um, architectural records, uh, things like that, that document peoples, people, businesses, organizations, and governments. These records are kept because they have continuing value uh, to the creating agency and to potential users. They are the documentary evidence of the past 
and they are the facts that we use to interpret and understand history. Our work in archives includes four core functions, assessing or evaluating records, collecting and organizing those records, preserving them, and providing access. Stewarding these collections provides many hands or requires many hands to ensure that resources are discoverable and accessible to researchers. Special Collections works with over 2,000 researchers every year, both in person and via email. After a collection is donated, our team works to arrange and describe the materials, and they create what's referred to as a finding aid or an online inventory. In the lower right corner of the screen, you can see an example of one from the Council of the International Exchange of Scholars, or CIES. The finding aid is a description of what materials are in the collection. It's worth noting that a finding aid does not include scans of the materials themselves, but rather a description of what you would find in the physical archive. Researchers use this kind of inventory to determine what materials they'd like to use if they do research with us in person, or what materials they might like to request for duplication or for further information. The finding aid tells researchers how large the collection is. In this case, the collection is 135 boxes for CIES. And knowing the size of the collection helps researchers to best plan their time when they're visiting in person or to scope their, their research request. The finding aid also includes the broadest possible topics um, included in the collection, such as main subjects, dates, and names. The records of the Fulbright program document the international educational and scholarly changes from the perspective of the United States. I always like to emphasize that perspective because for the majority of our collections, except for the Australian American Fulbright Commission papers, all of the records that we have are principally uh, created and collected by Americans. And so researchers do see a, a very particular perspective as part of that, that collecting focus. We would love to expand to include other perspectives, uh, but right now we are, are primarily US based. On the screen are several of the Fulbright program related collections that we have. So the J. William Fulbright papers, the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board records, the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs Historical Collection, NASA's Association of International Education, and of course, we're very proud to be the Fulbright Alumni Association's archive. Most recently, we've entered into an agreement with IIE, or the International Exchange of Scholars, and that collection was supposed to be shipped to us in March of 2020. Uh, so uh, that has been delayed, but we're very excited to be adding those records to our archive, hopefully later this year. In turn, our researchers write articles, theses, and books. They produce documentaries, record our orchestral suites, and talk to their families and friends, thus broadening the reach of collections and the organizations and individuals whose stories are contained within these collections. In addition to working with students and faculty on our campus, as well as with scholars from around the world to use the Fulbright collections, we've also scanned and published three digital collections that you can see anywhere in the world using any internet browser for free. The projects include A Calm Voice in a Strident World, J.W. Fulbright Speaks, the Fulbright Program 1946 to 1996, which was a project completed in celebration of the 50th anniversary, and most recently in the upper corner of the screen is our most recent project, uh, which was published earlier this year, and once completed will include over 10,000 pages of archival documents from the collections to document the history of the Fulbright Program. So why might you use these collections? You might be interested in using them if you're looking for information about a particular country, if you're interested in understanding how specific programs developed, or if you're curious about the Fulbright program more generally. It's worth noting that while our collections include a lot of incredible material about a wide variety of topics, one thing that we don't have much of in the collections are documents related to the specific experience of specific Fulbrighters. Uh, so we do have uh, directories from various years throughout the Fulbright program, and those directories include a list of names and dates of, of where people studied, and so those have been digitized and are also available online, but that's not a complete record. Uh, we also have what's referred to as post reports or uh, written experiences that Fulbrighters wrote after they came back from their trips. But separate from that, we don't have a lot of information about specific Fulbrighters. And so that's a question we often get. And so I always like to explain that that's an, a kind of a gap area for us in our collections. So if we dive in a little deeper to the most recent collection that's been digitized, um, in May, we launched this collection as an, and as Lawrence said, it's part of a Chancellor's Innovation Fund grant. And we're very grateful for that financial support from the University of Arkansas. I'd like to give a big thank you to Kara Flynn, who is our research and education services archivist who selected the items to be included in this digital project. 
as well as to our digital services team who scanned the items and to our metadata services team who made the items discoverable and searchable. So the digital project includes materials from the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs Historical Collection, as well as the J. William Fulbright Papers. Specifically, the items document the establishment of the program and some of the early commissions. And what we've tried to do with this most recent project is to create a jumping off point for researchers interested in exploring a lot of different topics that you can explore through these collections. And so we've, we've gone with breadth rather than depth uh, in terms of the kinds of material. And we hope that you'll reach out to us and do more research with the collections once your interest has been peaked uh, through these digital archives. The materials include photographs by national commission agreements and reports from programs located in countries around the world. In the upcoming months, we plan to continue to add to this collection, and we look forward to growing it over the coming years. So the search box on the screen is one way that you can explore this rich resource. By clicking on the Digital Collections tab, you can enter a search much like you would in Google. You can also click to browse the collection and use the boxes on the left side of the screen to narrow your results. This kind of search strategy would be particularly useful if you were going to search for a particular country or date. Unlike other digital collections that we've published, this collection is arranged in the order you would find the physical archives. So if you imagine coming to our, our library at the University of Arkansas, you would uh, come into our, our reading room and we would bring out boxes that you had, you had asked to use. And within those boxes are folders with uh, hundreds and thousands of pages of materials. And so what we've decided to do here is to organize the digital collection the same way the physical archive is, is organized to try to mirror that in-person experience. So on the screen, you're seeing a folder from the India country file that's in the physical collection. And in the middle of the screen, you're seeing the first document that's in that physical folder. The circle on the right side is highlighting the next item in the folder, which you would see once you uh, were to click on it. If you were to then scroll down the page on the right side, you'd see a series of other documents which are all in that same country file. You can then click on any of those documents much like you would if you were going through those physical folders. I'd like to thank you for your time today, and if you're interested in learning more about our digital collections or our physical archives that are housed in the division, my contact information is here on the screen. Um, as we continue today, I'll be putting some links in the chat so that you can explore some of these collections on your own. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Lawrence. Thank you, Lori. I'm just so excited that the, um, of course, our collections are, are growing and growing, but I'm really excited to, by the degree to which they're becoming more and more available to members of the public, uh, you know, so that our, our you know, Fulbright alums or prospective Fulbrighters can access those materials and, and see the originals for themselves in digital form. That's really exciting. So our third um, panelist, last but not least, certainly, is Carol Sushan Lee, whom I'm very proud to introduce as Dr. Carol Sushan Lee, who just finished her PhD in Asian Pacific Studies and with a particular expertise in public diplomacy and international exchange. And this expertise has been enhanced by a, uh, by a 30 year career in, um, in diplomacy with, with the government of Taiwan in the Ministry of Information, the Presidential Office, the Ministry of Science and Technology, um, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So a very extensive um, uh, uh, resume for her. And we were very pleased to welcome her to the University of Arkansas campus to do research in these growing collections. Um, Unfortunately, she came right before COVID hit. She was one of the last guests that we welcomed before things shut down in 2020, but she nevertheless was able to do the work that she did and produce an excellent dissertation on the history of the program. And she's here today to talk a little bit about her work in those collections. So Carol, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. And you're, you're muted still. Carol, I think you're still muted. To share my screen, something happened. Okay. Share all. Okay. Oh, man. Uh, Mune, would, would you help me? Yeah, we can see your screen. You just have to start the presentation now. Okay. Okay. The oh. 
yeah, you, you'll have to go, yeah, sh uh, sh go back to share. Go back to share. Yeah. Yeah, I, I click my and then share. Okay, great. And then you just need to start the presentation at the bottom there, that little icon at the okay. bottom. Okay. There you go. Yep. Uh, sorry about this. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Dr. Hare. Thank you for your kind introduction. It is truly my great honor to participate in this forum. Um, my part is to share my research on the Fulbright program in Taiwan, and which has a history as long as the Fulbright program exists. And to share my research experience at the UARK Spatial Collections. I think most of you may have known that the Fulbright Taiwan is regarded as the first Fulbright program in the world. The Taiwan's program history can be traced back to November 10th in year 1947, when the two governments of the USA and the ROC, uh, Republic of China, they signed the first bilateral Fulbright agreement to use the war surplus, some may call it the war junk, for the educational exchanges. Based on that agreement, the world's first American Fulbrighter, whose name is Dr. Dirk Bada, I hope I, I spell, pronounce it right, from the University of Pennsylvania, who arrived in China in August 1948. That put the Fulbright Exchange into action. This is the story of how Fulbright program started changes, started changing people's lives. However, due to the Chinese Civil War, the ROC government retreated to Taiwan, which also pushed the Fulbright program in China to be suspended in 1949. Later in 1957, the China program was able to be reactivated in Taiwan, and the Binational Commission was also renamed to the United States Educational Foundation in the Republic of China. With a new funding made available from the US agricultural surpluses. In 1979, the US government switched her political recognition from the ROC government to the PRC government. The Binational Fulbright Commission in the ROC was renamed again to the name called the Foundation for Scholarly Exchange. With to, upper, to continue its operation of the Fulbright exchanges with the people in Taiwan. Yet the legal status of the FSE or the Fulbright Commission in Taiwan was never resolved until two, year 2010. The organization was not legally registered in Taiwan. The operations of the Fulbright exchanges in Taiwan were handled extra legally and all issues was resolved case by case. Now the Fulbright Commission in Taiwan is officially recognized and registered as an international entity. My research finds many unique aspects of Fulbright Taiwan. Just to name a few, the Taiwan program is the only commission-based program where there are no official ties with the US government. Secondly, it is the only program whose budget does not come from the Fulbright appropriation, but through the, an official representation in Taiwan, which is called the American Institute in Taiwan. Third, to me, the most surprising one is the Fulbright Taiwan was able to operate for 30 years with no legal status. As of now, the Fulbright Taiwan hosts the largest English teaching assistant program, the ETA program in East Asia and the Pacific region, and perhaps the world's largest ETA program. Its financial support was 100% dependent on the US government, that was once. And now 83% come from the Taiwan government and Taiwan's a private sector's contribution. I find the Fulbright program in Taiwan is a remarkable case of people-to-people -people exchanges and a fantastic case of international educational exchange for public diplomacy. 
Now move on to regarding my research on the Fulbright archives. Yes, although this is not my first archival research, yet it is the first time to deal with a law a case with a 75 year long history. Not to mention the complications of the political background and the situations. So I was I expected to be buried in thousands and thousands of files. Luckily, my first stop at the Fulbright Taiwan, which has just digitized their files, including all the minutes of their board meetings since 1957. Also, a living history was there to help from its retired executive director, Dr. Wu Jingji, who served Fulbright Taiwan for 32 years. Finally, my final stop was crucial and critical for feeding the last pieces of my puzzle. Of course, the UARK spatial collections of Fulbright archives. My fortune seemed to have continued as I made the kind of host Dr. Hare and the very knowledgeable and most importantly, very helpful research service coordinator at the spatial collections. While I was wondering how to get started on the 366 boxes of CU files, identifies as MC468, the special list on duty approached me and proactively offering a brief introduction. Also following my in research in interest, that's the case of Taiwan, he guided me and brought me the first box to start it. Yes, that was exactly the right one to get started. started. Having my fortune departed or was it to be continuous? 10 days after my arrival in Feltville, COVID hit Arkansas and the library was shut down for, for in-person research. My research was pushed to be done virtually and remotely. I was and am more great than grateful the staff at the spatial, spatial collections continued to support my research by scanning and sending the digital files to me. Without their extra efforts and the, and the resources I have found online, this research just cannot be done. Taking this opportunity, I'd like to convey my sincere thanks to the people at the spatial collections and to, to you, to Dr. Burrell, for you have led a great team. Having gone through the difficulties of the assessing the archives in person, I would say I cannot appreciate more the UARK's new project of digitization. One, one way to increase the impact of Fulbright program is to encourage more related research. I believe that the digitization of the archives will definitely offer a great help. Thus, I'd like to do, make some suggestions. If it is possible, I wish the UARK's spatial collections will become the research center of the Fulbright programs and the International Educational Exchange, a center that integrates all the archives and the resources from the related agencies who deal with the Fulbright program, including the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board and the Worldwide Fulbright Commissions and the IIE. And that's, I'm glad to hear that you've already signed agreement with the IIE. Last, in my research, I have put Taiwan's case in a background with the other eight Fulbright commissions in the East Asia and the Pacific region. A brief comparison of these nine commissions shows each program has its own unique story to tell. Thus, I'd like to echo some scholars call for the more, mon more country studies on each commission-based foreign Fulbright program. Thus, a complete story of Fulbright program history may be told. From the perspective of public diplomacy, the impacts of a two-way exchange program is just like two sides of a same coin. Thank you. That's uh, the end of my presentation.
Thank you, Dr. Lee. I, I think that's a that's a pretty fascinating suggestion that you have there at the end. Um, I'd like to follow up on that. A, a couple of questions are are coming in, and and I see that one kind of overlaps with what what I was going to ask. And Lori, I want I want to direct this at you while while others um, bring questions in. You had mentioned, <clears throat> well, well, Dr. Lee mentioned that that it serves the program to have a stronger research center or set of centers that would facilitate country-based uh, and, and, and program-based histories. And, and then you had mentioned gaps, um, particularly with individual Fulbrighters. Could you talk a little bit about um, what commissions can do or what individuals can do to support that collection, whether with their own donations or, or whatever it may be? Sure. Um, so I think I think there are a lot of things that that individuals and commissions can do. So I'll start with the commissions. Um, it's it's my uh, thinking that as long as the records are somewhere and can be ac accessible to researchers, that that's a great step. Um, we would love to expand our collecting, as I as I said, to include um, the papers of other uh, commissions. Um, but it's really important to us that the records are saved and they are somewhere. I think sometimes we we assume that if things have been digitized, they're they're uh, permanently available and sort of permanently safe or saved, and that's not necessarily the case. We see that there is um, uh, uh, I don't want to use the word corrupt, but that's the word we use in, in libraries. Files become corrupt, so they they can become hard to read um, or degraded over time, and so. Um, we still do rely uh, heavily on those those physical archives. So I would suggest if you do have them, please consider saving them. And if you think that we're the best uh, place to help you do that, I'm certainly happy to talk with you. Um, and in terms of individuals' um, experiences, you might think about donating your what you have from your experience to maybe your own university or college if if you went uh, if you uh, went to university, or you might think about other other archives that that might be a good fit. We maybe um, we don't really have the capacity to to um, collect every Fulbrighter's uh, archive. I wish we were, um, but we're certainly happy to help you make those connections. And Dr. Lee, just to follow up, one, one of our attendees has sort of asked about how this sort of thing benefits the commissions. How do, how do they benefit from having access to um, archival records and, and their own histories? Oh, actually, um, the... The, I, I do research on these online commissions uh, and the Australian has already has uh, digitalized uh, all their documents uh, online and if that could be linked then um, more people knowing that. And the case I study is uh, Taiwan and Taiwan has uh, all these uh, digitized uh, all their documents because their space are limited. And I visit uh, Aust Austria, that's a uh, when Nani was there as an executive director, I see the archives, it's just gigantic. I'm so amazed that, you know. So there's lots of the documents in the commission. If the commission could kind of by countries, they digitize and then, and, you know, have it integrated into Arkansas, I think that was, was terrific, you know, one country at a time. You know, I was encouraged by reading the book from Australia, you know, and I just read, uh, Dr. Barrell uh, saying that uh, you, uh, that's the item you have the Australian American uh, Fulbright Commission, all, your, all their papers is there. But yes, uh, so, so I think one at a time. And then um, there's making one country a history at a time, and that will be complete all these uh, 49 commissions the history and from the, the other side of perspective. That's I always uh, think, you know, a lot of research I have done is from the U.S. perspective. Can we be looking at it from the other side of the country? I think that's what my suggestion is. Yep. Nani has something to say? Yeah, certainly. I uh, First of all, I really want to commend uh, Carol for such a fine dissertation uh, because it shows uh, how much work needs to be done on individual countries. She's very, very sensitive to the regional nature of the program. And then there are five different world regions because East Asia and the Pacific has its own uh, culture, which is certainly different than uh, uh, Europe and Eurasia or, or, or Latin America. So uh, there's a tremendous amount of work to be done. Many commissions have signed multiple agreements 
And Carol uh, has the distinction of dealing with the most complicated binational uh, program in terms of the number of agreements and the politics of the Chinese Taiwanese uh, American relationship and uh, really has done a fine job in sorting, sorting that out. Uh, the first generation of agreements was, were signed b uh, between 1947, starting with the Chinese one, and 1961. Then the Fulbright-Hayes Act put the program on a new statutory basis and provided for a second generation of agreements that facilitated, and this is very important, co-funding of the program by partner governments. Uh, as Carol pointed out with her slide, this program initially was exclusively funded with US revenues. And now in the Taiwanese case, where 83% of the funding is coming from the Republic of Taiwan, uh, the, the funding has, has, has shifted. Uh, that is many, many of the commissions, uh, many of the countries of binational commissions uh, match or even outfund the United States uh, today. So the, the binational structure uh, is also a binational financing for bilateral exchanges and, uh, uh, and the reciprocity uh, is an important aspect uh, of the program. Uh, binational commissions contribute on an average of about $100 million in cash and in kind uh, to, the, uh, to the program annually. And these commissions are really the historical uh, uh, core, the statutory, the philosophical and historical core of the program. Uh, although there are only 49 of them operative, they do account for uh, uh, almost 80% of the program alumni. Uh, in the early 60s, the State Department also started uh, unilaterally managing individual Fulbright grants out of US embassies. This is a different, it's ultimately a different kind of Fulbright program uh, compared uh, when compared with a, with a binational uh, uh, commissions. So uh, the uh, what, one last word about individual archives. Uh, Lori and Carol, Carol both went out, you know, the the source material in, in Arkansas is uh, based on sort of an American perspective. And the individual national archives are a tremendous asset because that's on the outside looking in. And you get different materials, uh, you get a different, you get a different story. You get a different story uh, uh, because uh, it, it, takes, uh, it takes two to tangle. So the uh, US perspective on the program is US centric and certainly the Austrian perspective on the program uh, is Austrocentric and the Taiwanese uh, uh, perspective is Taiwanese too. And the, the diversity of perspectives uh, uh, is uh, a, a, a fascinating uh, statement on culture and politics here. And, and they've shifted also throughout the years. Uh, you know, I would add to that, that that interest is, is is personal for, for the grantees. And, and one of our, our participants commented about having her, her the, their letter when granted a Fulbright from Peru in 1989, they, and they still have it, right? So, it's, so it ha has personal significance to them as well. And that, that can motivate folks to keep, uh, you know, keep records from their experiences. This is, this is a transforming experience for so many. Um, Lonnie, one, one of our, our participants, at, of, course, of course, I can see that we're, we're generating interest in the, in the scholarship program, and I'm, I'm going to put in the chat the, the link to the U.S. Fulbright Programs website for those that are interested, but also asking about other programs um, uh, uh, around the world. Are there programs in India, for example? Of course, there are, but not all programs are run on through by through by national commissions, right? I mean, what, what, how does that break down commissions versus State Department control? Uh, the, the the bilateral commissions were one of the unique characteristics of the original uh, legislation, uh, and uh, they were established by an executive agreement between the uh, Department of State and the representatives of foreign government to establish these bodies that have equal numbers of board members. And they're responsible for handling the program uh, on the ground and managing uh, managing it on a bilateral uh, uh, bilateral basis. Uh, 
uh, uh, these commissions also provide in many, many cases for uh, co-funding the uh, co-funding uh, uh, for the program. Uh, the so-called post or embassy based programs which, which exist in 100 other countries, the, 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 the program really does have a global reach, uh, are unilaterally managed and uh, unilaterally financed by the State Department. Uh, so the decision making there is all uh, in house. Uh, whereas the decision making uh, with the binational commissions is uh, uh, based on a parity of board members working together. Another another attendee has asked, "How can Americans show show gratitude for the contributions that the binational commissions make?" That are the, as uh, Carol showed in her presentation, many of these commissions are putting up more of the funding than the U.S. government is to support these programs. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I think I, I echo to that uh, Lonnie's uh, saying is uh, yes, so when uh, after 1961, uh, Fulbright Hayes uh, um, eight, so the two countries all, all signed agreement. The research I have found many countries, so they, they do have some like 50-50% uh, that co share and also pushed by State Department. But in Taiwan's case, lots of the funding is from the private sector donation or contributions, not necessarily from the government side. And I think that's very encouraging. Some is from the private sector, they feel that's a good thing, we need to support that. And some is just from the individual uh, full writers uh, in, uh, I mean, the foreign countries. I find many cases that's a Japan, I find Japan, Korea, that in Taiwan, they all just want to contribute. So this is more like I, I just bring it back when Nani do the uh, presentation. Yes, yeah, so that's one of the mission is a public private collaboration. This is what the Fulbright. And I think encouraging more private sector to do the contribution may be one way to do that because now the government has all this difficulty to handle with the COVID. And I think, I don't know how, how to do that, but uh, I don't want to, um, there's a one country I find that because uh, right into the agreement, there's a 50, 50% 50 contribution, but because the US government cannot increase their funding. So what's the foreign country can do? They cannot increase it more than 51%, right? So the other ways that they fund, they using the uh, co-name program or the private sector donation. That's not counting into the 51%. So actually Taiwan's 83% from the uh, Taiwan size contribution is not exaggerated. I think uh, they are more than 90% in Europe case too. Yeah, thank, thanks. That's that's a, it's a complex picture for sure. Laurie, uh, uh, yeah, Lonnie, I'm sorry, go ahead. I simply do want to say, uh, if you're interested in doing something, you can, uh, you can advocate for the program. And the uh, Fulbright Association is involved in advocacy. That's very important. The uh, program is chronically underfunded. Uh, funding for the Fulbright program peaked in 1966. Uh, and uh, it, was, it, it was cut uh, by the Johnson administration uh, in the fiscal year 1969, and it has never made it back up to those levels, uh, despite everything that has happened in between. It's been a real roller coaster ride. Uh, but in real dollars, it's, 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 it's at or below the 1966 level. This makes the co-funding by the binational commissions, which has gone from zero to over $100 million, important. And it makes these third-party contributions uh, also very important. Uh, second, not only advocate, you can donate to the program. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there are a number of, uh, if you go to the individual uh, commission websites, there is usually a donate button there, uh, or you can uh, ask, ask how to do it. So if you, if you log on to uh, Fulbright AT, uh, you can donate to the Austrian American program if you wish. And, right, and, and you'll notice that 
um, John Bader has put in the chat some links if you want to uh, support or advocate for Fulbright programs. There's some links there to help you do that. Lori, for, for um, participants who may be motivated, to, I'm hoping everyone will go to the website now and take a look at the digital collections. What, what kinds of limits um, come into play with respect to privacy rules and those sorts of things about actually seeing and accessing the records? Sure. Um, so we certainly um, adhere by privacy standards. Um, what we try to do with these digital collections is to put up um, primarily government created records. Um, so these are not necessarily records created by private individuals, but those who are working through the government. And so that's, that's one approach that we've taken, particularly with these collections. Um, and then as we look at modern collecting, so thinking about our work with IIE and, and hopefully other, other commissions and other organizations, we are thinking very carefully about um, adhering to um, different, different privacy standards. It becomes increasingly hard when you, you're looking at digital records. So thinking about things like email that contain a whole lot of private information and a, a whole lot of information, which we as archivists love to know uh, because it helps us understand the context of the records, but we certainly understand that not everyone is comfortable with that. And so we're taking a very careful approach and we're currently rolling out um, what we call a digital preservation uh, system and program that will enable us to collect born digital records, so things like emails, um, but also keeping in mind, of course, those privacy standards and regulations. Yes, thank you. Uh, maybe one more question, Lonnie. Your book is called Remembering and Forgetting. What, what are we forgetting? Uh, the the program, uh, the reputation of the program was established in the first 15 years already. Uh, and as long as the, as the good Senator was around and uh, in office, uh, there was a very, very strong advocate for the program and for the uh, for, for exchanges uh, in, in Congress. Uh, uh, I think sometimes we forget what makes it work. And that is this uh, binational spirit, uh, the spirit of collaboration. If one is tempted to assume this is a US government program subject to the uh, American national interest, which uh, changes every four, every presidential administration, uh, that's, uh, that might be a, sort of an instrumental approach to exchanges uh, which is not compatible with the philosophy or the mission of uh, the Fulbright program as initially conceived uh, and exercised and lived in particular by countries that have binational uh, commissions. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I'd like to thank all three of the panelists for these phenomenal contributions. This is terrific. And then to close this out, I'd like to invite John Bader, the executive director of the Fulbright Association to, to say a few words, John. Thank you, Lawrence. I want to start by thanking the panelists of this uh, terrific Fulbright Forum, uh, uh, Lori, uh, Carol, Lawrence, and of course, my old friend, Lonnie. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to listen and to learn to all of you. I also want to thank um, uh, all those who participated as the audience, all offering some good questions and engagement and I look forward to uh, seeing many of you in future Fulbright forums as we offer them in the coming months and years. Um, I thought I'd end with uh, building on uh, uh, Lonnie's point about memory. Uh, this past weekend, and in fact, most of this year, I've been giving thought to how we think about, how we remember these 75 years of the Fulbright program. A little bit of arithmetic points out that for those 75 years represent a full one third of all American history since the Constitution from 1789. One third of our history is marked by this effort to empower individuals like you and me to have a role in the future and prosperity and peace of this planet. It's an extraordinary idea that endures because it is such a great idea. Uh, and yet, as Lonnie has pointed out, it, it does not continue automatically. This requires our engagement, our support, our leadership, 
our financial involvement, uh, our political will. And uh, so I invite all of you to, to continue to stay engaged so that the next 75 years are as successful as the first. Um, I'd also say that this panel has reminded us that there is importance in both preservation and understanding. So it is easy enough for us to try to preserve our memories or our papers in a, in a box somewhere, but it doesn't really help unless we explore those opportunities, unless we take advantage of those resources, just as the University of Arkansas has done by digitizing so many of these uh, records to make them accessible to all of us, not just those of us who can make it to Fayetteville. So therefore understanding is as critical as preservation. And, uh, and of course, understanding is fundamental to the Fulbright ethos and its mission. So I invite you to take uh, fullest advantage of that uh, uh, archive. It was also noted though, at the end that uh, the Arkansas archive is not collecting individual stories, but that's something that you can do and that we can do as a Fulbright Association. In fact, one of my asks to all of you is that you go right to our website after this presentation, click on uh, share your stories and provide us a, a, a brief uh, anecdote from your Fulbright experience. Uh, add to that a, a photograph or two, and you are then sharing that uh, uh, experience with our community. Every day we put out a uh, a new social media post with a new Fulbright story. You can, of course, go to Facebook and other social media platforms to subscribe to just that. Anyway, I want to thank again all of you. Uh, Lawrence, thank you for your leadership on this panel. Uh, Lori, for your help with this archive. Carol, for extraordinary scholarship. And Lonnie, for being one of the, one of the great leading lights in our community, holding up and holding dear uh, the, the, these memories and uh, important features of the program. Thank you so much. I will with that uh, close us down. Thank you all for attending and I hope all of you have uh, a, a nice day and stay in touch with us. Remember that uh, registration for our conference in October is open and we look forward to seeing you then.